Hey, paisanos, it's the Super Mario Brothers Super Show! Yep, it's the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. A show which took Mario and Luigi out of their popular video games and put them onto our TV screens with lots of zany slapstick adventures. The show was broadcast in 1989 and was unique for its time, as not only was the show an animated series based on Mario, but it also featured live-action segments featuring Lou Albano and Danny Wells as Mario and Luigi. The animated segments were more like the video games, which would see Mario and Luigi in the Mushroom Kingdom trying to defeat the villainous King Koopa, who is always up to some evil scheme. Except for Friday broadcasts, which would show the animated adventures of fellow Nintendo property Zelda. And the live action segments were more like a sitcom, which focused on the daily life of the Plumbing Brothers in their Brooklyn apartment. And my five-year-old self absolutely loved it and couldn't get enough of it. And this show always had me doing the Mario. Do the Marios! So it's time to go into a warp zone back to 1989 to explore 10 things that you didn't know about the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. So let's all do the Mario as we check it out. I'm doing the Mario. As we always say, neatness counts. That's right, Mario. And by the way, you have a little piece of spaghetti on your overalls. <laughs> you, Luigi. And you have a little bit of spaghetti sauce on your shirt, as usual. Oh, really? Number 10, acquiring Mario for prime time. During the mid-80s, the Super Mario Bros. video game was released on the original Nintendo Entertainment System. And for its time, it was a game like no other. In fact, it still is a game like no other. It's a game that took gamers into a magical world where they can travel to many strange and fantastical locations and destroy villainous monsters and save a princess. And of course, fans of the games couldn't get enough of its mascot, the mustachioed Mario, along with his brother Luigi. Two Italian-American plumbers who travel through pipes known as warp zones. Yes indeed, the Shigeru Miyamoto creation had captured the world's imagination with Mario becoming the face of Nintendo. Nintendo is, well, almost the most fun a kid can have. Also at that time, an animation company called Deke was also having flights of success. As in that cartoon brand whose cartoons always seem to end with that little boy in bed in the middle of the night who randomly says the word Deek, <laughs> as you do. During the 80s, the cartoon company was having great success with shows like Inspector Gadget, Mask, and The Real Ghostbusters. So naturally, Dix, CEO at the time, Andy Hayward, saw great potential in making a TV show based around the Mario Brothers. However, Nintendo took a little more persuasion, as according to Hayward, they originally turned him down, and it would take him a whole year to convince Nintendo to allow him the rights to make a show based on their beloved character. So with that, not only were fans going to be able to play Mario on their Nintendo consoles, but also watch weekly daily adventures of the heroic plumbers. Number 9, Original Premise Series creator Andy Hayward knew from the start that he wanted Mario to not only be a cartoon, but to also have live action segments to be shown at the start of the show and to also conclude it. This is because he felt that Mario was unique, so a TV show would have to be done in a different way, rather than just using the standard animation only format. The Ringer.com suggested that the design to have both live action and animated segments could have been inspired by Pee Wee's Playhouse, which was a popular children's TV show at the time, and that that show's producer Steve Binder even came on board to be executive producer to the Mario Brothers show. Binder incidentally also directed the Elvis Comeback Special and the Star Wars Holiday Special. Yeah, this guy literally went from Elvis to Star Wars to Mario. However, the original premise of the show was a lot more ambitious than what we got. 
The show was originally called Super Mario Brothers Power Hour, and not only was it to feature cartoons based on Mario, but also other Nintendo properties, including Zelda, Castlevania, Metroid, Double Dragon, and Californian games. However, this idea of the show being an hour long with multiple Nintendo-based properties was dropped, with the exception of Zelda, despite some promotional material of the other cartoons being drawn up. Instead, each episode of Mario would be placed in a 30-minute time slot and shown on weekdays, where Monday to Thursday would feature Mario adventures, and then of course Friday, which would feature a Zelda cartoon called The Legend of Zelda. Well, excuse me, princess. The show would also be made in alliance with Nintendo America, Saban Productions, and Viacom, and it would be heavily promoted by MTV. Number 8. Reluctant Mario Now the premise of the Super Mario Bros. Super Show was relatively simple. The show would start and end with live action segments of Mario and Luigi in their Brooklyn apartments, played out very much like a sitcom for kids. And then the animated features would more resemble the video games, where we would see Mario and Luigi in the Mushroom Kingdom, accompanied by the princess and Toad, where they would often have to go on fantastical adventures to defeat the evil reptilian villain, King Koopa. So the production had to find the right actors who could both play Mario and Luigi on screen, but also provide their voices for the cartoon segments. Series creator Andy Hayward was keen to get Captain Lou Albano as Mario, as he had previously worked with him on the cartoon Hulk Hogan's Rock and Roll Wrestling, in which Albano was a character playing himself. Albano was a professional wrestler who was well known in the wrestling fandom, and he also seemed to be good friends with Cindy Lauper too, as he appeared in her music videos for Girls Just Want To Have Fun and The Goonies Are Good Enough. When Albano was offered the role, he initially turned it down, but later changed his mind when his wife convinced him to take the job. In order to become Mario, he had to shave off his iconic beard, which was actually part of his wrestling image. And I didn't want to shave it off. I mean, I was used to the wrestling with a rubber band in my beard and this and that. The guy looked at you and said, you can't go with that. I said, I don't want to know that. But he soldiered on and became Mario. The role of Luigi was given to character actor Danny Wells, thanks to his skinny stature, which would contrast to Albano's larger frame, just like Mario and Luigi. He had also already done voice work for deep cartoons, namely Heathcliff and the Cadillac Cats and the real Ghostbusters. He was probably most well known for the sitcom The Jeffersons. But uh, Danny Wills was very funny and very good in Super Mario and uh, he's a great guy. Contrary to popular belief, the Super Mario Brothers Super Show wasn't the first live action appearance of a Mario brother, as in 1983 there was a commercial advertising the Mario Atari game, which featured an actor playing Luigi who frantically called out, Mario, where are you? In an actually impressive commercial that featured several odd creatures and iconography from the games. Number 7. Making the series was super fast. According to Luigi actor Danny Wells, he and Lou Albano would spend a hectic six days a week filming their live action segments in a studio, and would then have to travel to another studio to record their dialogue for the animated segments. Albano and Wells did have amazing chemistry on screen, which was described as an Abbott and Costello dynamic. According to co-producer John Gruzd, it could be tricky filming with Albano, as he wasn't really an actor but more of a live performer, whereas Wells was an actor. So you couldn't really direct him, but rather just let him perform in his style. And that trying to direct him could be a nightmare, as you were going to get the exact same performance with each take, which was based on his own style of performing. But Gruzd further added that Albano was the loveliest of human beings. And Albano's past with wrestling actually helped out with the more physical scenes in the show. It is even said that Albano and Wells would often improvise their lines on the spot while filming. And to me growing up, this was Mario and Luigi. They captured how I always felt Mario and Luigi to be like. The animated segments on the other hand were a different beast. The first problem facing the production at Dick was that they just didn't know how to make a story for a TV show out of a video game. To them it felt basic. Mario runs around and jumps on enemies and saves a princess. So the writing team had to really try and figure out how to make a fluent show out of the imagery seen in the games. 
So to try and create scenarios for the animated segments, the writers would often spoof well-known movies and other stories, like Mad Max, Sherlock Holmes, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Dracula, and so on. The animated segments were based around the Super Mario Bros. video game and Super Mario Bros. 2. The third game hadn't come out yet, but more on that later. The animation for the show was provided by South Korean animation company Say Young Animation, who really had a challenge ahead of them, as the show had to be made super fast, as they were working on a really tight schedule, as Dick had already ordered 52 episodes, in a process that would see four episodes being animated a week. It was super stressful and had to be done super quick, and due to the strict timing schedule, the animation had to be kept simple and flat, and probably led to the sloppy mistakes in animation that fans have noticed over the years, like the Indiana Joe character not having a face. <laughs> yeah, whoops. A mistake that has really gone down in infamy. Number 6. Do the Mario. Oh yeah. With the Mario Brothers and plumbing's a game, we're not a memorable aspect of the show was its theme songs, both its intro theme and outro theme song. The music for the show was composed by Suki Levy and Haim Saban, whom had made many memorable themes for children's cartoons, including Inspector Gadget and He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. The song that started the show off was called The Mario Rap, also known as The Plumber Rap. So yeah, the show starts off with Mario and Luigi singing a rap. With the Mario Brothers and plumbing's a game, we're not like the others who get... All resources indicate that it's Lou Albano and Danny Wells singing, but I don't know, it doesn't sound like them at all. I searched high and low to try and find out who the actual singer was, but didn't have any luck. Now I did see one chat going on on Reddit, which was about who the actual singer of the Mario rap could be, and there was one comment there by someone who believed that it could have been the Wayans brothers. But, once again, I just don't know. Either way, it's a fun song to get the show started with. But regardless, to me, the best song was the end song, which was called Do The Mario, where as you can see, Mario has put together a dance for us all to join in called The Mario. So, how do you do the Mario? Well, I'll let him explain. Swing your arms from side to side. Come on, it's time to go do the Mario. Yep, just swing your arms from side to side, and just like that, you're doing the Mario. I love the visual too, how they have Lou Albano dancing in front of a green screen, where he's being placed in random spots in a Mario landscape. You can also tell that this song was performed by Albano, and what helps with it being so catchy and memorable is that it uses the original Mario Brothers theme tune. I also love how happy and enthusiastic he is. This is a very happy man who really wants us to dance with him, and he's not going to let the fact that he's dancing on his own stop him from busting out a jam. It's like your friend's dad or some lonely man who really wants to dance and really wants us to dance with him, but no one is, so what the hell, he's just gonna dance anyway. <laughs> Something that always made me and my sister chuckle as kids is the very end of the song when Albano says, Just like that. Just like that! Where it cuts back to him in the center of the picture, but Albano wasn't quite ready on cue, where we see him sort of do that little duck. Just like that! I don't know why I find this funny, but I just do. And oddly, it just goes with his Mario character, so I wouldn't want it any other way. Just like that. Also, when watching this show as a kid, I could remember actual famous songs would often appear throughout the series, mainly in the animated segments. Going by memory, I can remember the show using Shut Up Your Face by Joe Dolce, Surfin' Bird by The Trash Men, and Hit The Road Jack by Ray Charles, and many more. So despite its hectic production, the show must have had some money behind it to acquire the rights to all these songs. It's the Mario! Either way, back in 1989, this show had us all doing the Mario, and it was great. Do the Mario, sweet! Number 5. Guest Stars Something else the show was well known for was its guest stars. It felt like every episode would have a well-known face turning up, particularly in the live action segments. I can remember watching as a kid and being like, oh wow, that's Winnie from the Wonder Years. Yeah, I wasn't expecting to see her turning up. Other famous faces to turn up during its 52 episode run include Magic Johnson, Elvira, 
Ernie Hudson, Cindy Lauper, and even Millie Vanilli. In animation form, mind you. Presumably before the lip syncing scandal. Seriously though, these guest stars could be so random, it feels like they just plucked out whoever just so happened to be walking in the studio that day. In fact, the show even managed to get the Queen. Yes, even the Queen seems to be a Mario fan. Okay, it wasn't the Queen Queen, but someone playing the Queen Queen. And that wasn't the only time a real life famous face was played by someone else, as the show even featured Elvis. Yep, a whole 12 years after his death. The show would also have fictional guest stars like Frankenstein's Monster and Santa Claus. But one of the most memorable guests was Inspector Gadget, as this was the first time anyone had ever seen a live action Inspector Gadget. Go, go, Gadget, come! Although in the Inspector Gadget cartoons the character was voiced by Don Adams, here he was played by Maurice LaMarche, who also voiced the character Egon Spengler in fellow Deke show The Real Ghostbusters. Number 4. Legal Issues Change Some of the Characters' Names Something that draws attention to the Super Mario Bros. Super Show is its villain, King Koopa, on the account that in the games the character was known as Bowser. Yes, his species was called Koopa, and he is explained as being the king of the Koopas, but to gamers he was simply known as Bowser. So, why not call him Bowser? Well, this was due to a contract licensing issue, which prevented the name Bowser from being used. So the character's actual name became Koopa. However, according to a website called Best TV Shows, by the time the Super Mario Bros. 3 cartoon came out, this legal issue had somewhat eased up, where he was now called Bowser Koopa. But he still couldn't be simply called Bowser. Yeah, let's face it, sometimes legal copyright issues are weird. It's like, oh no, better not call him Bowser. Likewise, the princess also had her name changed, as in the games she was known as Princess Peach. Or is that Daisy? But here she's known as Princess Toadstool. Could that be the same legal restriction? Well, probably. Speaking of changes, I always felt like the live action segments felt different to the animated parts, as they just didn't look or feel the same. Now the look of the animation was based on guidelines set by Nintendo, so naturally the cartoon actually did really resemble the games. But the live action segments always threw me off, as Mario had big hair, whereas he didn't in the animated bits, and Luigi looked a lot older than how he did in the cartoons. And this is a pet peeve, but it always baffled me that Mario and Luigi wore white button-up shirts, unlike the games, or cartoon for that matter, where they wore their iconic blue sweaters. And what made the live-action segments feel even more alienating from the cartoon is the fact that those segments used a laughter track. What's wrong? Kinda looking forward to going dancing. The nerve of that Mel Gibson taking my girls. <laughs> a laughter track? Why a laughter track? Seriously, what a dick move. <laughs> oh, come on, cut that out. Stop it. Oh, come on, can you guys just stop? I mean, I've got the missus coming over here soon. <laughs> Number three, Super Mario Brothers 3 ended the show. So for its time, the ratings for the Super Mario Bros. Super Show were very good. Within its first week of being broadcast, it had become the highest rated first run syndicated series of that time. However, that feat would be beaten by Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers a few weeks later, and then reruns of the Muppet Babies. But it was still doing very good and seemed to be embraced by Mario fans. However, after its first season, Deke did the unthinkable and cancelled the show. Yep, despite being a hit, they decided it was time to give up on this current format. And it's all because something else big was happening in the Mario Mythos. And that was indeed the release of the Super Mario Bros. 3 video game, which was just insanely successful. So Dick decided that rather than continuing to follow up with another Super Mario Bros. Super Show season, they decided to focus on making a show solely based on Super Mario Bros. 3. So the Super Show wasn't canned because it was bad, but because Mario 3 was so damn good. And I guess they felt there was more success to be made following that game than their own show. 
So it's here we get to the adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3, despite the fact that there was no TV show called Super Mario Bros. 2. A show which really tries to recapture the magic and glory of the third game, and look as much like it as possible. But sadly this time there was no live action segments, and Lou Albano and Danny Wells didn't return to voice Mario and Luigi, which I find sad. And then one year after that, there was an animated series based on Super Mario World, the first Mario game released on Super Nintendo. But I find that these two animated series aren't as remembered as much as the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, nor does it seem to share the same fondness. I don't know, it's like it lost its charm. But these weren't the only shows to be spawned from the Super Show, as there was also a Koopa-themed variety game show called King Koopa's Cool Cartoons, which was hosted by King Koopa himself. Now, I never saw this show, but what I do know is Koopa was played by a performer in an impressive but uncomfortable looking Koopa costume. And then of course there was Captain N, the Game Master. Now I know this show gets a lot of shade these days, but as a kid, I loved this show. I loved the premise of a kid in the real world getting pulled into a video game, where he meets famous video game characters and goes on exciting video game adventures. Maybe the execution was misguided and that it could have been better, but the premise was definitely there. I mean, what kid wouldn't want to go inside a video game and meet their favorite characters and play the games for real? Although, I will say, even as a kid, I found the Simon Belmont character to be insufferable. I did not like him. There's only one person who can cheer up the princess, and I'm looking at him. And the main kid, Kevin, is kind of egotistical, because he is Captain N, and he even has an N on his red letterman jacket. I mean, who would wear a red letterman jacket with the letter of their own title on it? I mean, geez, ego much? Number two, a change in format. So yeah, as I've mentioned several times now, something that made the Super Mario Bros. Super Show stand out from most animated TV shows was the fact that it also featured live action segments, which was something of a novelty. However, upon repeat broadcasts, it seems that the powers that be fought otherwise when it came to showing us live action Mario and Luigi. So with later broadcasts, the Mario and Luigi live action segments were replaced by a bunch of young hip kids in a set that literally looks like the 90s just threw up all over it. The show was now called Club Mario, and I've never seen this rendition, but according to Wikipedia, the premise is the show was now hosted by young teens whom are all Mario obsessed fans. Look, I get the logic behind this. Maybe it was felt that Mario and Luigi, two middle-aged guys, just wasn't cool enough, and they wanted to reach out to the young crowd, but I don't know. Upon viewing some clips, it just loses the charm of Albano and Wells. Replacing them with cool 90s kids just makes it feel dated and obnoxious. And if you're watching a show about the Mario Brothers, wouldn't you want to see, you know, the Mario Brothers? Naturally, this new format also didn't last, and it disappeared into obscurity. Okay, maybe it didn't. After all, we didn't get Club Mario here in Australia. But I've personally never heard anyone talk about it. And in addition to that, it does seem like there was some kind of issue with the live action segments, as I can also remember being a kid and getting my hands on some VHS tapes of the Mario Brothers Super Show, which always had the animation bits, but all the live action segments were always cut out. And upon doing research, that seemed to be the case with home media releases of the show in other parts of the world too. And I have no idea why. I don't know if it was a copyright issue, or if the distributors just felt like kids wouldn't be interested in the live action segments. But either way, I always missed them. Even during the later 90s, when the show would get repeated here in Australia, the live action segments were deleted, despite the show actually starting with the Mario rap intro, which featured Albano and Wells. However, thankfully when the show was finally released in a big DVD box set, all the live action segments were restored in their entirety. And it's great being finally able to see them again. I guess after all this time, someone finally realised that fans actually do want to see the live action segments that they grew up with. And I think regardless, they were part of the show. And Albano's and Wells' efforts should be acknowledged and celebrated. 
Number one, reception and legacy. So although kids who grew up watching the Mario show may have loved it, what did the critics have to say about it? Well, the show actually got pretty mixed reviews, with USA Today calling it a surprising disappointment that lacks wit and relies too much on slapstick. And Albano's and Wells' acting was also often criticised. But on a positive, it was also felt that the show could sometimes be funny. Yeah, I guess sometimes. A bit harsh. Look, I don't know what these critics were expecting. It was a show for kids. Now, I will admit, in later years, some people would go back to the animated sections and talk about how silly and sloppy they were. And I will admit, upon reflection, the animated parts are not without their faults. <coughs> and maybe the writing could have been better. But as a kid, I loved them, and I was totally on board. And it was fun seeing Mario go on adventures. Adventures that look like the same worlds seen in the games. So I can't fault it or trash it for the innocent joy that it gave me as a kid. At the time, after the show's 52 episodes were broadcast, the show kind of quickly became forgotten about, thanks to the as-mentioned Super Mario Bros. 3 video game, and then in 1993, for better, or worse, there was the Super Mario Bros. movie, with Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo. A movie which looked less Mario Bros. and more Blade Runner, interestingly enough. And so, for the longest time, the Mario Bros. movie was pretty much the only live-action Mario that was being brought to the conversation. Probably, if anything, as to how weird and polarizing it was. But thankfully, in later years, fans who grew up with the Mario Bros. Super Show have gone back to it and have come to appreciate it for what it was. Okay, there are still some people out there who may not entirely remember the show. Upon looking up a clip of the live-action segments on YouTube, I saw this comment by someone who was astonished that the show actually existed, as they thought it was some kind of fever dream they had as a kid. <laughs> well, yes, the show did exist, and Lou Albano and Danny Wells once donned the overalls to play everyone's favourite plumbers. Sadly, Albano passed away in 2009 at the age of 76, and Wells passed away in 2013 at the age of 72 so they are no longer here to see the fan appreciation of their show grow. Now, Albano and Wells may not be the best portrayal of Mario and Luigi, that's debatable, but they will always be Mario and Luigi to me, as they were the first renditions of the characters that I ever saw outside the video games. And I think that all Mario fans should, at some time, try to appreciate their efforts to bring these characters to life and to entertain us. They literally took these amazing characters out of their video game format and gave them charm, humour and personality as they brought Mario and Luigi into the real world. And if you were a kid at that time, they brought the characters into our hearts. So, with a new Mario movie on the horizon, it's time to go back and check out the Super Mario Bros. Super Show and see what the on-screen world of Mario looked like in the late 80s and early 90s. A world built on a TV budget. Anyway, I'm Minty. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Just like